everybody, and welcome to In This Corner, the podcast, season three, episode 31. Boxing's biggest names, boxing's biggest stories, boxing's biggest fights, boxing's greatest memories and moments, sports entertainment at its best, with its best. That is a mouthful, especially when you have, um, I'm under the influence of what Lee Groves has called crud disease. That's what I, I don't have COVID this time. I've done this show under the influence of COVID, but now I've got, according to, to Lee, crud. And of course, we are joined by the boxing writer, author, historian, CompuBox counter, Lee Groves. And it is that time again, big fight time as tomorrow night from T-Mobile Arena, 7,200 belts will be on the line. <laughs> Actually, Eight belts will be on the line, or is it seven belts will be on the line? We'll dissect that later, <laughs> but it's definitely a big fight with two great fighters. Canelo Alvarez takes on Jermel, not Jermel, Jermel Charlo, and we'll be breaking it down with boxing trainer Tommy Yankello, the WBC buck 40 pound champion Regis Progray. It'll be Amber Renee Dixon. Uh, she is the host uh, of uh, of a show on PBS here in in Las Vegas, and does a great job. Was a sports uh, caster before that, and and she's just uh, the consummate journalist. And she's going to break the fight down with all the betting angles, and there are a plethora of them. But we're going to start out with what we usually do a little bit later on. And that is uh, getting you folks caught up as to everything uh, going on that just took place over the weekend. And we had a bunch of stuff. And I know you have a lot on your mind. And uh, while I deal with the crud, you can tell us uh, about all the activity that took place and the ramifications from. Well, of course, uh, ESPN Plus, the main event of uh, last week's ESPN Plus show, saw Jay Lee Zhang repeat his knockout victory over Joe Joyce, and he did it in half the time. Fight fight one lasted six rounds. Here it landed three or it lasted three rounds. And Joyce tried his best to do the right thing strategically. He protected the right eye by moving constantly to his left and keeping his right glove pinned to his face. But Chang zigged where he should have zagged, zagged where he should have zigged. He knocked him out with a picturesque right hook to the jaw. And uh, first time that Joyce had been down in his career, I believe, and the fight was over. So let's first praise Zhang for proving to everybody that he has more weapons than just a southpaw left down the middle. He shook Joyce with every punch that he landed while Joyce's blows barely registered. Uh, Zhang was not the same guy who went life and death to get, get a draw with Jerry Forrest two and a half years ago. But more importantly, Joyce was not the same man who looked like a legitimate world title threat a year ago after he knocked out Joseph Parker. I mean, what do you make of all this, Smitty? What does this mean for Zhang and what does this mean for Joyce? Yeah, it's interesting times in the heavyweight division, interesting times in boxing. Zhang, for whatever reason, looks like he's peaking at age, what is he, 40? And 40. 40, and it looks like Joyce has uh, hit the other side of the mountain and then some, and he's, what, a, a couple, few years younger, I believe. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I just, I I just, I don't think Joyce, and it's I know it's the first time that he was, uh, you know, knocked out in devastating fashion and all of that, but I just don't see any room for him to come back from that and do much unless he wants to end up in, uh, you know, like a Dillian White, or um, what's the other one? I always Chisora. <laughs> yeah, you know exactly where I'm going. Yeah. Chisoraville, Whiteville, Journeymanville, um, you know, Gatekeeperville. Uh, mm -hmm. That doesn't mean they're not good fighters, but they're old, and we don't we 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 need some young blood in the heavyweight division. However, Zhang has enough zing, I think, right now to deal with anybody. He's fun to watch. He's peaking at at his age. And I think with that pop in the straight, you know, what it was, the it was the straight, wasn't it the straight left the first time right. that did all the damage? Now it was the right hook. So he's, he's added that punch. 
Um, and I think he's a formidable out for anybody now, now, but that is now. By the time he gets in there, if ever, with a Fury or with an Usyk or with a, a big baby, or he, he might be, you know, 47. So the way boxing is these days. So, but right now, I think he's fun to watch. And uh, so we'll see if we'll be watching him again soon. But a great win for him, a devastating loss for Joyce. And I and people might say I'm uh, overblowing the, with using the word devastating, but I think the way Joyce lost these la last two fights, given his age and the way he looked to me, uh, he might want to think about calling it a day. Yeah, agreed. Uh, I mean, one of his greatest strengths was his ability to take a punch. And now that's gone. And now he's lost two in a row. He had all the momentum in the world. Now it's gone. It's unfortunate for him, but we wish him the best going forward. And we certainly wish Zhang the best going forward. Uh, and speaking of going forward, we go to the DAZN main event uh, between Richardson Hitchens and Jose Zapata. And in the main event, Hitchens advanced his record to 17 and 0. He'd scored a near shutout over uh, the same Jose Zapata that our guest Regis Progre knocked out to win the belt he currently holds. Um, Hitchens won with superior ring generalship, boxing skills, uh, but not everybody was enamored with the way that he performed. It was clinical, it was effective, but it was, wasn't really that exciting. Um, Shakur Stevenson faced the same criticism after, you know, he scored a dull decision over Jeremiah Nakatila. And Stevenson, who was, you know, disappointed with his own performance, he responded by recognizing that there was a problem. He decided that from there, th that point forward, to take more chances, inject more power into his game while remaining in his technical envelope. And he's responded by uh, stopping Jamel Herring to win a belt at 130. He floored Oscar Valdez uh, uh, in winning a decision. He outclassed Robson Conce Sal, and uh, he stopped Suichiro Yoshino to make his mark at 135. And now he's going to fight for uh, one of the belt for the WBC belt that was stripped from Devin Haney. Um, if Hitchens is to make an impact, he's going to have to borrow from Stevenson's uh, playbook. He's got to become more exciting or else his wallet is going to be a lot thinner than it could could have otherwise been. But the real the real news was made on the undercard of, of this card. Uh, first, there was Connor Ben. Uh, he, he came back for the first time in 17 months after his doping suspension. And he won a 10 round decision. He landed power shots at will, uh, but it was the kind of fight that validated both his critics and his supporters. On the one hand, uh, he was unable to hurt or drop a Roscoe which feeds into the narrative that his KO power was the result of the PEDs. On the other hand, Orozco had never been knocked out in 38 previous fights. And also this fight was at 154 and not 147, which might have negatively affected Ben's power as well. To me, it was exactly what Ben needed after such a long time away. And with this win, you can bet that the drumbeat for Ben versus Eubank Jr. will start up again, right? And then the uh, the other big story from the undercard was the draw decision that allowed Jessica McCaskill to retain her WBA and WBC welterweight titles and Sandy Ryan to keep her WBO championship. Now, many observers thought Ryan was robbed, and I believe much of that sentiment had to do with how the fight was called by the commentary team. Uh, Ryan was praised to the hilt throughout the fight, while McCaskill's deeds went largely unnoticed or they were minimized. And that, along with Chris Mannix's scorecard, painted a very specific picture of what they felt the decision was going to be. And when the draw was announced, the first thing that was said pretty much was robbery. And that was the uh, sentiment expressed by 99.9% .9 of social media. Now, I think announcers have a lot of clout when it, term, when it comes to how fights are perceived, especially with fans who don't pay attention to every second of every round of the fight, like judges do. Um, fans usually, uh, you know, they drink their drinks or they talk with their pals and they don't watch the fight that closely. They, they trust the announcers to sort of guide them along because they're perceived to be experts, right? And when the result goes in an unexpected direction, the experts say robbery, therefore it must be a robbery. Now, as for me, 
I thought Ryan did do enough to win the fight, but I agree with Mike Ross's score of 96-94. And one can even make the case for 95-95. Judges, especially American judges, prefer aggression and high work rate. And McCaskill was the one moving forward most of the time. And she threw nearly 200 more total punches. And she trailed 139 to 133 in total connects. It's very close. It was 5-4-1 and one if you use the CompuBox round-by-round round breakdown of total connects. It was a pretty close fight. Ryan won, but it was close. Um, I thought Ryan won the fight because she boxed well at long range. She hurt McCaskill several times with body shots. And she was far more accurate. And I believe that if the same fight had been held in England, Ryan probably would have won by 97-93 due to the home ring advantage. But the fight was held on U.S. soil. McCaskill was defending two of the belts. She was the bigger name. And she exceeded the expectations that were based on her losing performance against uh, Chantel Cameron the last time out. Did Ryan deserve to win? Yes, she did. Was this a robbery? No, it wasn't. Will there be a rematch? I hope so. And both fighters want it as well. And because they want it, it'll probably happen. But don't be surprised if the rematch is held in the UK. And don't be surprised if Ryan wins the second time around. Yeah, you're right about announcers shaping the narrative. And so many of the announcers today, this is, uh, uh, I, I, we don't have enough time to get into that. And uh, I'm due for a tea break anyway here. But, I mean, so many of the announcers are fanboys or fangirls. And th when they have the expert common commentators there with them or, you know, or lack thereof, uh, most most of the fighters that come in and do it try to do a good job. But sometimes mm -hmm. they get caught up into too much trying to be some brilliant uh, orator and they fall away from what they really should be doing is telling us about the X's and O's and why this fighter is doing more of this or less of this or what fighter A should do or shouldn't do or fighter B should do or shouldn't do. I pride myself when I do fights. I've been guilty of it too at times as a young broadcaster, maybe getting too close to a fighter or to a situation and you might almost, even though you're trying so hard not to, you know, you let yourself get caught up in it but as I, you know, uh, aged and, and had more experience, I learned that how important it is to be honest and to have integrity, especially in a sport like boxing where it where lives are on the line. And, you know, a loss can be devastating. A loss can cause a fighter to you know, never have that financial security. One loss sometimes. So, yeah, and, and I would rather side with hey, you know, this fight could have gone either way. Uh, and again, I'm one of the few in the biz that score draws uh, for rounds, even rounds. I score even rounds because sometimes a round is even, uh, you know, especially when you've got four different criteria. So interesting. And I wanted you to get that all in and you did. And it is time yeah. for a tea break. And then when we come back, speaking of somebody who breaks stuff down, boy, if you want to learn uh, the sweet science from a trainer who breaks it down better, as good as anybody in the, in the sport, Tommy Yankello, his world-class boxing uh, channel is phenomenal. He'll join us to break down Canelo and Jermel, who go at it tomorrow night from T-Mobile Arena right here in Las Vegas. And Showtime's going to tell you about that right now. We'll be back. For the first time ever, reigning Undisputed Kings fight on boxing's biggest stage. I'm the king. Mexican icon and pound-for-pound -pound all-time greats, Canelo Alvarez. King Canelo! Takes on the elite superstar set on making history, Jermel Charlo. The power is for real! Two kings, one throne, no mercy. Championship heart! Canelo versus Charlo for the undisputed world title. Saturday, September 30th, live on pay-per-view. Back on In This Corner, the podcast, and let's begin our breakdown of tomorrow night's showdown. Canelo Alvarez, Jermel Charlo for a plethora of belts. We'll get into that a little bit uh, later on, but now we're going to break down the intricacies of the battle, and we're joined once again by... 
a man who really has a, uh, a, a treasure trove of pugilistic instruction. If you go to his Tommy Yankello's world class boxing channel and uh, first off, welcome uh, back to the program, Tommy. Thanks for having me, Jim. How you guys doing today? Pretty good. Uh, I'm a little bit uh, I'm I'm battling uh, a little bit of, a, of something. I'll find out what the something is a little bit uh, later on. But we're going to talk about this battle that's going to take place tomorrow night in the squared circle at T-Mobile Arena. But before we get to that. And you and I and Lee were chatting before we uh, started taping. I mean, you are everywhere with your world class boxing channel. I see you on Instagram. I see you on Facebook. I see you on YouTube. I see you TikToking and yik yakking and everything else. So <laughs> tell the folks, tell the folks the best way so they can absorb the what I call the treasure trove of great pugilistic instruction. Tell the folks what's the best way to do it. Hey, James. I'm James. I'm on uh, YouTube on the World Class Boxing Channel. And uh, I have uh, Tommy and Kella Boxing on Instagram and also on Facebook. And then on TikTok, it's uh, at Tommy and Kella Boxing. Or actually, on TikTok, it's just Tommy and Kella. On the other ones, it's Tommy and Kella Boxing. So those are the those are the uh, those are the what four sites you can watch. I do the tutorials on all four sites there. And uh, and I, what I, I love, I, what I love about him, obviously, well, yeah. obviously for a youngster coming up, it's great. But also even for veterans, even veterans can can pick up stuff from what you do. I, I it makes me think of uh, on my television show. I, I was in the ring with 65 world champions going over the techniques that made them all uh, greats and, and, and some of them legends. But even a guy that's been fighting a long time can learn just, you know, maybe reminders of subtleties. When you look at what you do, are you doing it for the young prospect or, you know, an amateur coming up or for just anybody and everybody who wants to better their fight game? Any Anybody and everybody. I mean, there, there are things that I put out that are, uh, you know, for the beginner to the elite because, you know, a lot of people – don't realize the basics is where it's at too. We when I so when I put something basic out for someone that's just starting, a lot of the great fighters still need to work on. I mean, that's that's what the foundation is, is the basics that make them great. You know what I mean? So, you know, like like Kobe Bryant, he said, never get bored with the basics. So, you know, like a- anything that I put out is is for everyone and everybody. I mean, it's it's and I show something advanced, it's for it's for it's for anyone, you know. If I show something basic, it's for anyone, you know. So, uh, yeah, it's for everybody. All right. Well, let's start to uh, break down what's going to take place uh, tomorrow night as I flip to Lee Groves. You know, one of the major storylines regarding Charlo, at least, is the weight jump from 154 to 168. Um, What can a trainer do to make sure that there's a perfect balance between gaining enough size to compete with Canelo at 168, yet retaining the speed and the elasticity of when he fought at lower weights. Sure. Well, Lee, I'm not I'm not somebody that really buys into this. Uh, he's such a uh, Canelo is such a much a big a much bigger Canelo is not he's not such a bigger man than everybody believes that he is because um, Canelo was. You know, when he started young, he was 140, 147, and a lot of the prime of his 20s, he was at 54. And, uh, you know, he he grew into a middleweight, I believe. But I think the 68 and 75, I mean, he's been the face of boxing. He's able to pick his spots. And I think that a lot of that, he's been blown up. He was somebody that went to the weights and did some other things. You know, there's, there's controversy there to blow himself up. But I, I don't think that Canelo is much more than a middleweight. And I believe that uh, Charlo is it was a big was a big junior middleweight, and he was about uh, you know walking around probably in the low seventies, cutting that weight to make fifty four. So you know he's ready to go to middleweight anyway. So him going to sixty eight is going to be. I still think that I just think the weight cut is less. So I just think it's it's just it's he's going to be stronger. He's going to be bigger naturally, but I think he's he's going to you know be able to feel better. Uh, He's just going to be basically cutting less weight. I don't think that he's going to uh, uh, have to do 
that much to really put on size other than just, you know, good food and hard training. I, I, I feel like, you know, he probably walk, he's probably walking around 175 pounds naturally. He's going to have to lose five or six where before maybe he was walking around at that weight and coming all the way down to 54. So, you know, and I think Canelo is probably not much bigger than that. He's Canelo is probably like 180. So for me, if you're asking me what I would do, Charlo, I, I'm, I'm old school. I mean, our skills pay the bills. I'm not, I'm not going to any kind of weight program or, I mean, we may, we may do a little bit of kettlebell training and do a little bit of kind of stuff to just maybe do some things, but I mean, I think the diet would be anything. It's just going to be able to eat, eat, eat more and feel good. Uh, you know, uh, a balanced diet, just to make him be, you know, basically I said, good food, hard training. Um, so rather just, than, rather than the strength and conditioning coach, you believe more like Freddie Roach. It's still more about technique, training, sparring yeah. skills, as you say, that pay the bills. Absolutely. Because I mean, pe people like, I think people get caught up in the weight classes too much because it's been proven in history time and time again, guys climb multiple weight classes and are successful. And, and I mean, back in the day when there was only eight weight classes, I mean, you jump one weight class, it's like jumping two today. So if you had Ray Robinson was at 160, he went to fight Joey Maxim, he would have won the fight if it wasn't for heat exhaustion probably. And he didn't put on side to do it. And then Ray they Leonard, also had to weigh in the day of the day of the fight, and that made it much more difficult too back then. They had to weigh in the day of the fight. Sure, and and and, and Ray Leonard. I mean, Ray Leonard was you know really never blew up, and I don't think he did anything extra. He just uh, went up in those weight classes. I mean, from forty seven. I mean, when he beat Matt Marvin Hacker, he was still really a welterweight. And then after that, he goes and fights Donnie Lalonde and. And because he was a again, he was the face of boxing. He was able to kill two birds with one stone, win one sixty eight, one seventy five. So you know, for me, Canelo, and, and, and I, this might make some Canelo fans uh, mad, but I just feel like Canelo, you know, is a little bit has been the face of boxing. You no, know, pick some spots. He's a little overrated. I felt like he lost to Lara. Felt like he lost to a, 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 a Gennady Glovkin and was already going downhill the first two times. And I, I just feel that you know he has, uh, you know. He's blown himself up in weight. He's a five foot eight, and he's uh, you know he's got a what a, a seventy inch reach. This kid's got a seventy three and a half inch reach. He's he's six foot tall, five eleven. I think when they get in the ring, if anything, Canelo might have a little bit of weight on him, but I don't think it's it's relevant size. Where you know uh, he's probably going to weigh in the ring that night one eighty, and this kid's going to weigh one seven. And, Charlo's going to weigh 175. I just don't, you know, and Charlo's the bigger, bigger man as far as height and reach and everything like that. So I just don't, uh, you know, like I said, the weight classes, I mean, you know, Henry Armstrong held titles simultaneously. And, and, you know, today I think the weight classes are made because more sanctioning fees, more money, more titles, more belts, more money, <laughs> you know old school with that. You know, if you could fight, you could fight. It's been proven in history that these guys go up in weight classes and, and win and, and win titles. You know, I know they make weight classes for a reason, but there's also, you know, guys that have proven that you can jump multiple weight classes, you know, like, like, okay, well, if we're talking about 54, going to 68, you know, before it used to be 47 to 60 or, or 60 to 75, that was always 13, 15 pounds. And these guys did it, you know? And uh, right. I don't think they did anything going those weight classes other than, like I said, a little bit, maybe hard training and, and eating. I don't think any of them did no crazy strength programs. Uh, Ray Leonard, all, all these guys that I feel like, you know, uh, I can go through a dozen guys that I just feel like in history that would have beaten Canelo. I mean, you know, yeah, no, I, I, and I agree with that. Keep going, Lee. Well, uh, other factors concerning Charlo is the 16 month layoff, the longest of his career. And the broken left hand that canceled his January fight with Tim, with Tim Zhu. Do you think that Charlo can hit hard enough with that left hand to earn his respect? And do you believe the long layoff will negatively affect his performance? Well, inactivity is always uh, always something that can negatively affect a fighter for sure. Um, so you know that that's going to be in question. You know, I I, I think uh, one thing that I like. Uh, that Ray Leonard said when he was off against Marvin Hagler, that he is just a really a deep thing on a thing mental. Like it's so mental too, because he says a fight of this magnitude, there is no ring rust. 
So, mm-hmm. you know, it's how much you get up for a fight. And I, when he said that, it was just like, man, it shows you how mentally strong Sugar Ray Leonard was and what made him such a great fighter and why he was so, you know, just one of the all-time greats, one of my favorites, and and that kind of statement. So I think it, 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 I think it depends on the individual, you know. And, mm-hmm. and, and so, Charlo, this is, those are things that are in question to hand. You know, I'm not privileged enough to be in camp or see how how and I'm not privy to those, that information as far as like, you know, and being able to see him spar and see how much affecting. I know he's definitely going to need that left hand. Um, yeah. He's going to have going to have to, you know, cut out a page of what Bival. I think he's got to do it. Uh, Dimitri yeah. Bival, Canelo. I think that's that's got to be his fight plan at distance and uh, use his jab, extended lead hand. Uh, not always bringing it back. He's got to like, and, and those are things that I kind of haven't seen is, you know, as good as, you know, Dimitri Bivol could do it is, I don't think Charlo's shown that, you know, as well, but he, you know, he's got, he's got some ability and I think it's going to be a really good fight, but um, to answer your question on the, I mean, I, you know, I, I've seen guys with hand injuries come back from it, you know, and, and been able to come back very strong. And then there's other guys that just keeps on plaguing them their whole career. And they've retired because of it. So, you know, it's something that uh, isn't definitely in question. It's a good question. Uh, yeah, you know. yeah, we don't know what we don't know. We'll find out on Saturday. Uh, the overriding narrative for Canelo is that many believe that he at age 33 is past his prime. Do you think that's the case? And if so, what signs of erosion do you see from a trainer's perspective? Well, you know, I think, yeah, he could be, you know, somewhat maybe sliding down. It's hard to tell. He 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 actually said that the reason he felt like the last two times he had a hand injury or wrist injury, I believe it was. Yes. Surgery, wrist surgery. There's a lot of questions there. There's a lot of questions there. For me, I've, I've seen that I think that he has, uh, I think, a little less elusive as far as his head movement uh, in the last few fights. Uh, since since Bivol kind of like and I think that he has he he's he's uh got away from a good jab, a good a good left jab which he'll need which he'll need in this fight to cut the distance and uh yeah I've seen some I've seen some uh some evidence there now whether whether like it has to do with the injury you know is another thing that's in question so like there's a lot of questions in these fights this fight here there's a lot of questions on both sides what must each guy do best to win the fight if you were in charlo's corner what does he need to do and if you were in canelo's corner what would he need to do well i think bivall i mean bivall i think charlo has to do what bivall did cut 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 out cut that page out right there and 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 just you know use the distance and and be the matador in the fight um keeping canelo at a distance using his jab really extended jab and uh tying canelo up and walking him back Making sure that the the uh, the pressure is not there to pushing him to the ropes and letting Canelo build up his momentum. You know, boxing is momentum. You know, so he's got to slow the momentum down. A lot of guys move, and then they just continue to move. We've talked about this before. You know, like uh, Pernell Whitaker, he knew how to keep that fight in the center of the ring. Evander Holyfield knew how to do it against Tyson. And you have other guys that let the pace carry them too fast, like Melzer Taylor against Chavez and. And and Camacho against Chavez, so he he's got to make sure that pace doesn't get too too fast, and the pressure and the momentum of Canelo doesn't start to push him to the ropes, and and really do basically like I said, like uh, the other fight was like when Caleb Plant. I felt like he he was very good defensively, but he moved too much, and at the end of that fight, that momentum just was kept on building for Canelo, and he was able to really uh, you know uh, inflict that that pressure and, and really, uh, you know, break, uh, Caleb down because Caleb's always moving. You're always moving. You're always moving. It's like, like I said, a truck coming at, coming down the hill, man, he just keeps getting stronger and stronger. Eventually it runs you over. So you have to right. keep on back before it gets that momentum. So he's got to, he's got to keep that fight in the center of the ring. He's got to, move, when he steps back, he's got to be stepping back to for a reason. Cause he's looking to counter punch and he's, and he's moving laterally. And, and moving around and keeping a, keeping a tight circle in the ring, keeping that tight circle, not going towards the ropes. And Canelo, he, he's got to do, you know, he's got to put the pressure on. So he's not going to put the pressure on like when he fought Bivol, he just put the high guard up and he just tried to, you know, tried to uh, be the bull. You got to be a smart bull. You got to use good head movement coming in. You got to use jabs to the body and the chest. 
and, and you you got to be able to hit what's what's not moving, which is the body. A lot of jabs to the body, a lot of fainting, um, mm -hmm. getting getting Charlo to you know maybe commit himself, and then being able to slide on the inside with her after you you know you know counter in the counter, you know, and while he's being aggressive as well, you know. So that that all comes down to some good jabs, some good feinting, good good uh, technical of learn how to you know learning. Uh, working on cutting off the ring the right way, left and right. And, uh, you know, he's got to cut the distance and he turned it into a fight. You know, I think he turns into a fight and he's, he's, he's better on the inside. He's a better, I think he's better than Charlo on the inside fighting. I think, uh, Charlo's got to, you know, like I said, be at a distance and, and box him. Sounds like you, uh, think it's going to be an interesting fight. Here's the question who wins and why? I do think it's going to be a very interesting fight uh, because of some of the reasons, some of the questions that are out there that Lee asked me, um, you know, but I think, you know, if every, if both guys are fighting at a hundred percent, I think it's, it was still a really good fight. Styles make fights. I think Charlo's got some strengths. I just don't think that he's quite as, uh, you know, efficient and as good as like a Dimitri Buval and, and maybe quite as, uh, you know, uh, skilled. So I just think that it's a really good fight. I think he's going to have his moments, going to be super competitive. Uh, but I'm going to pick Canelo in this fight in a decision, though. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a close fight. I could even say split or something very close, you know, even if it would be unanimous, one or two point fight, uh, fight win. And uh, I just think that he'll do enough to win the fight. And I, I, I can even see it being, you know, where if, if Charlo really has some really great moments and wins a lot of rounds, I think that he'll still in Vegas not get the decision. <laughs> I just think that, uh, History's there. Yeah, it sounds like you think it's like the first Gennady uh, Golovkin, which I thought was an easy fight to score, should have been in Gennady's favor. But well, you've been you've been on a roll. You haven't had you've yeah. had. Uh, well, Lee, he's had every fight correct, right? Since he's been on with yeah, us. I think so. he's the only one of us who has gotten every prediction correct. Yeah. So there you there you go. Tommy likes uh Canelo by a close decision. And and one more time before we let you go, how do the people uh get a hold of you? Are you gonna uh YouTube world cl uh world class boxing channel and also Facebook and Instagram at Tommy and Kello Boxing and TikTok at Tom Yankello. And trust me, folks, uh, somebody that uh, has been in the ring with 65 world champions, his instruction, uh, his teaching uh, and explaining, it's as uh, good as it gets. We will take a break and we will come back with the WBC Buck 40 pound champion, Regis Progray, to help us break down Canelo versus Jamel right after this for the first time ever reigning undisputed kings fight on boxing's biggest stage I'm the king. mexican icon and pound for pound all-time greats canelo alvarez king canelo. takes on the elite superstar set on making history jermel charlo the power is for real. two kings one throne no mercy Championship hard on display. canelo versus charlo for the undisputed world title saturday september 30th live on pay-per-view back on in this corner the podcast breaking down canelo alvarez jermel charlo tomorrow night at uh, t-mobile we're joined by the wbc 140 pound world champion his title will be on the line december the 9th in san francisco Against Devin Haney, we can say that that's official now as we welcome back to the program my buddy, yes. Rougarou, Regis Progray. How you doing, Regis? All good, man. All good. Out so, Cali, training. In training camp already started a little early, so I'm, I'm good. Feeling good. Real good. And when did it come out that it's a – I know you, you, you signed for it. You've been training for it, but it's right. been made official as of what, today? As we today. tape, awesome. As today, yeah, today is yeah, today it became official. And what can you tell us about how the negotiations went? They took a damn while to get it done. How were the yeah, negotiations? It, yeah, that that was the thing. The negotiations took a long, long time. Um, you know, at first it was uh, they wanted to do it on the twenty eighth, and you know, and, and 
and our sides wasn't agreeing, and it was like my side was in the dark about his side. It just it just was a lot going on, basically. Um, and then I saw I actually signed for November 11th. That's the date I signed for. And now they're coming out. They said, all right, it's going to be December 9th. So I was like, all right, whatever. It's cool. That's just a month. That's just a month after. So, you know, it's fine with me. So, um, okay. yeah, it, was, it, it, took a, it took a while, but, you know, we got it. It's finally here. And we're not going to we're not going to pressure you to talk much about this fight. Uh, we'll have you on again before your fight. My only thing to you as as a guy who fought a little bit and as somebody that considers myself a friend of yours is be careful not to be overtrained because I know you've been training for this damn thing because you thought it was going to happen earlier. So I know yeah. you're cognizant of that as I flip the Lee Groves. Right, right. Well, now let's talk about the fight at hand uh, tomorrow night, Canelo versus Charlo. Uh, Charlo is not only moving up to weight classes, he's also fighting the undisputed champion in that weight class. Uh, you've yeah. sparred with your beer guys and, and fighters can feel these things. Can you describe to us the difference between fighting and, or sparring someone close to your own weight class and someone who's nearly 15 pounds heavier than you are in terms of speed, power, other things that you can perceive? It's just, it's a big difference. You know, it's, it's a real big difference. You know, that's, for me, that's why they make weight classes. I mean, listen, my, I definitely tip my head off to Jamel for going up and, you know, chasing greatness, you know, um, but it, it, and, and, you know, we grew up together and stuff and obviously I'm definitely rooting for him, but at the same time, that's a big, big task. I'm not gonna lie. You know, if it, it's one thing to go up, you know, it's one thing to go up two divisions and you fighting, you know, you starting off, you fighting somebody, you know, you just, you starting off. You're not. You're not fighting nobody that good. You're going up two divisions, but you're going up two divisions and you fighting the face of boxing. You know, one of the greats. You know, if you know one of the all time greats, it's gonna be a big task. Um, you know, and, and I think it's. I think the main difference will be is the power. That's why I think the main difference is gonna be the power because Canelo is not just. You know, he's not just a. You know, like a undisputed champion, but. Say like a Devin Haney, he would know would not too much power. You know, he's the undisputed champion. He has a lot of power at that weight class. So um it's it's gonna be a it's gonna be a tall order for Jamel. And not only is he going up two weight classes and fighting the best fighter in the division and who has power, he's also gonna be fighting for the first time in 16 months, which is the longest break of his career. Um, what does ring rust feel like to a fighter and can anything be done about it during the course of a fight? Well, yeah, ring rust is definitely real. Um, you know, like they say, you know, it's, um, when, when you out for so long, you just, you don't know how your body is going to perform because you haven't been out. You haven't been in the ring for, for such a long time. I think something that you can do about it. I heard this, I heard Sugar Ray Leonard did this. I don't know if it's true, but, um, one thing you can do, you can simulate an actual fight as far as you can you can tell somebody, you know, let's put the small gloves on. And obviously, you have to pay somebody real good. And, you know, let's, you know, we can do that. Put the smaller gloves on and let's, you know, let's um shut the gym down and let's let's do 12 rounds with the actual gloves on. Um, I, I don't know how true that is about, like I said, Ray Leonard, but you can try to do that. But at the same time, the ring rust isn't just about the sparring it's about the whole event at the same time you know getting in there and um just when you you have to do a lot of media you have to do all these things um for a big fight so yeah ring rush definitely plays a you know it does play a, a, a really big part so it's it's gonna be interesting to see how Jamel is gonna adjust to that and as far as the Ray Leonard story it was a uh, training for the Marvin Hagler fight and yes I saw the, the reports at the time indicating that he did have some simulated real fights and in one of those fights he actually got hurt and stunned to the point where he changed his fight plan uh in order to uh to accommodate that so yeah you're, you're right, right about that Reese. um yeah. many observers including smitty and me believe that canelo's best days are behind him do you agree and if so from a fighter's perspective what signs do you see in canelo that indicate that he might be going over the other side of the mountain I mean, I really can't agree with that. Not just yet. That's the thing. I can't agree with it because, listen, his last fight, you know, in his last fight against 
Um, he fought John Ryder. I was there, and you know, obviously, he fought at home. He fought in Guadalajara. That's where he's from. It was like mm -hmm. sixty thousand people in the stadium. Um, you know, I I know how it feels to have the hometown stuff. You know, when you have a hometown fight, it's just a lot of not only the pressure. You just you just have so much stuff. You know, everybody just tugging at you from every different way. So it's a lot going on. It's not it's not even about the crowd. It's just about you you home you you know in 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 your your family. All this stuff is tugging at you, and it's hard to kind of it's hard to deal with all that stuff. It really is. It's hard to deal with all that stuff at you know when you're at home. So um. And in, in, in that fight, you know, obviously he didn't look like the Canelo, but I I just want to see how he's going to perform with this. And and obviously we, we talked about the B-ball thing, you know, he lost against B-ball, but he did go up pretty high, you know, and, and I just saw a thing said today that he wasn't 100% and all that stuff. So I want to see, I, I do want to see what he looks like, you know, on, you know, um, against Jamel. So what does each man have to do best in order to win the fight? If you were in Charlo's corner, what would you tell him to do? If you were in Canelo's corner, what would you tell him to do? I, I would tell Jamel, um, you know, be relaxed, be loose, box, definitely box. You know, use your range, you know, try to box. And, you know, if you can catch on with some hard stuff, try, um, you know, when you can. But don't get too greedy. Um, I think that's what they said about Ryan Garcia with Javante. They said, look, catch him. Don't get too greedy because he has a lot of power. You know, you get too greedy, you can get caught. And that's exactly what Ryan Garcia did. He got too greedy too early. He got caught. But if you would have kept his if you kept his distance, he probably would have had more success. I think the same thing with Jamel. When you fight somebody with so much power like Canelo, and he's, I mean, so much power, and he's two divisions higher, you have to, you know, stay away as, you know, as much as you can and don't get too greedy. Um, and of course, if I was Canelo, I mean, you just tell him do him. That's all, you know. You just tell him, you know, you just tell him do him. It's it's nothing that you know. His fighting style is just. I mean, I think Jamel has the more. He's the one that has to adjust his game plan more than Canelo, basically. And uh, who are you picking to win, and why? I'm going with Jamel. Because that's a friend. <laughs> I was, that's a friend. That's I'm going with Jamel because yeah. that's one of my friends. You know, um, it's just like it's the it, you know. I mean, obviously, more more people going for Canelo, but I'm going for Jamel. That's who I want to win. You know, but and 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 on that point though, you said some interesting thing. He's a guy you've grown up with, so to speak. And uh, I I I don't. I'm not as concerned. My eyes tell me Canelo is on the way down, way down. But that's I've known the guy and watched him from day one. And even right. though he's younger by two months, he's fought uh, 206, 261 more rounds, I think. Uh, is that right, Lee? 261 rounds and uh, 26 more uh, fights. But I want to ask yeah. you about the character of Jermel. I don't think, I, I'm not so much worried about Canelo being too big. I'm worried about the moment. This is a, when you fight Canelo, as you said, you're fighting like the face of boxing. It's a huge event. Everything he's had to do, he's faced nothing like it. You know the dude. Can he handle the mental side of this? Um, I would say yes and no. Um, well, I I wouldn't say no. I would say I, I I don't know because I would say yes because he's for me. Jamel wants that. He really, really wants that big moment. He yearns for that. That's that's something. This is something that he really, really wants. He really believes in himself. He really wants this. It's not. He doesn't shy away from that. Now, the actual night when the pressure does come, when you know when he he looks around and sees how big this moment is. I don't know. I don't know how big of. I don't know if it'll get to him or not. But I would think I say yes because you know he wants it. That's that's a person that really, really wants this. He's very hungry. He wants to prove that he is the best. He has a he had a chip on his shoulder since you know since he was since he was a young kid. He always had a chip on his shoulder. So I think that I would say yes because of you know it's just he really, really wants this. He know he's going to be the underdog. He really wants to prove everybody who he is. He does. He has a big, big time chip on his shoulder because you know. Um, I think a lot of people don't give respect that he deserved because he is undisputed at 154. And you know, a lot of people just, I, I guess the people don't, they just don't like him, you know? So they obviously, since they don't like his personality, they don't, they don't really give him the respect he deserves. You know, and I, I also think that what you said is true. The key component for him 
because he has all the boxing ability, the boxing skills. He has really good power, uh, good legs. It's going to be about, I think it's really going to boil down to a, to disciplined. I think, you know, and I, and I think that's what you're seeing. If he's disciplined or can be disciplined for 12 rounds, it, it, you feel like he's got a hell of a shot. Would you, ob would you think it would be a decision win uh, for him if he does get the victory? Or do you think he could stop Canelo who has a great chin? Yeah, I don't, I, I, just, I don't think he can stop Canelo. I think it'll have to be a decision. I can't. If he stop him, that'll be huge. But I don't <laughs> think he can stop Canelo. I mean, you just got to look at Canelo's resume, man. He fought Triple G three times. Huge, huge punch of Triple G three times. He fought B-Ball. Uh, he fought Danny Jacobs, uh, James Kirkland. He fought. These are huge, huge punches. I mean, really big punches. And, you know, none of them never got close to, you know, stopping him, hurting him, nothing like that. So I don't think I don't think that he can stop him. You know, he would have to, you know, get a decision. Are you uh, going to be able to break camp to be at the fight or are you going to you, you stay in focused on December the 9th? Stay, stay in focus, stay in focus on December 9th. I'm going to watch it. I'll definitely be watching. Probably have a little fight party or something like that. I'll, I'll go watch it. Some, I'm, I'm still on the West Coast, so I'll go watch it somewhere in L.A. or something. But um, I'm not. I'm, I'm staying focused. Well, you stay focused. I can't wait till we get closer to your fight and get a chance to uh, break that down and talk about it. He is the WBC 140 pound champion. That title will be on the line against uh, Devin Haney. And uh, that'll be a fun one to talk about as it gets closer. Regis Progray, who's been on our show more than I think any damn guest. Thanks for joining <laughs> us once again. Get back to work, my friend. Always. And thank y'all. For the first time ever, reigning undisputed kings fight on boxing's biggest stage. I'm the king. Mexican icon and pound for pound all time greats, Canelo Alvarez. King Canelo. Takes on the elite superstar set on making history, Jermel Charlo. The power is for real. Two kings, one throne, no mercy. Championship heart on display. Canelo versus Charlo for the undisputed world title. Saturday, September 30th, live on pay per view. Back in this corner of the podcast, one final segment to go. What a great way to bring in. There she is. And she started with us, of course, from Nevada Week on Vegas PBS. She is a uh, journalist extraordinaris, Amber Renee Dixon. How you doing, Am? Hola, I'm doing well. I'm happy to be here. Fun fight ahead, I think. Yeah, I, 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 well, it, it, no doubt it, it'll be a, a fun fight. And, and you're going to, of course, uh, give us all the betting perspective on it. But before we do that, um, I started out the show, you know, joking in some ways, saying that this, uh, there, there's 72 belts on the line in this fight, including an extra belt. So, Lee, do, do us all a favor clean up the belt stuff. It's supposed to be undisputed, or is it? Well, it was billed as undisputed versus undisputed because Jamal Charlo enters this fight as the undisputed champion at 154, and Canelo enters the fight as the undisputed champion at 168. Only Canelo's belts will be on the line since they're fighting at 168. However, um, the WBO ruled in August that while Charlo will be billed as an undisputed champion, he will be introduced as an undisputed champion, the moment the bell rings, the WBO will strip Charlo of its bell and give it to Tim Zhu. So when the fight begins, it's not undisputed versus undisputed. It's undisputed versus three belt champion. So that's the world of boxing that we live in. And As Morgan Freeman so appropriately said in Million Dollar Baby, everything in boxing is backwards, but continue you because there's another belt on the line in this fight. Uh, Mauricio and the WBC have come up with something, and it it reminded you of another thing that the WBC did with a belt back in the day. Tell the story. I know Amber will get a kick out of it. <laughs> okay, so the belt in question that they're going to award in this fight is called the Puebla belt. It's one of the many commemorative belts that the WBC has given out over the years. And mostly at Canelo's fights. Uh, the Puebla belt is a definitely Mexican belt. So we get an idea of where Mauricio Suleiman's head is at as far as who he thinks is going to win the fight. Because how awkward is it going to be for Mauricio Suleiman to award a Mexican belt 
to a definitely non-Mexican winner if Jermel Charlo wins the fight. Now, that reminds me of a story that happened in July 2006. It involved Curtis Stevens and Marcos Primera. They were fighting for something called the WBC Youth Super Middleweight title. Now, the youth belt is awarded only to fighters who are 23 years old or younger. Now, Curtis Stevens, who came into the fight with a record of 13-0 with 11 knockouts, was 21 years old. His opponent, however, was Marcos Primera, who had a record of 19 wins, 15 losses, and two draws, and he was on a five-fight knock a losing streak, and he's 33 years old. <laughs> so the fight goes apace. It first six, first seven rounds goes apace. Curtis Stevens is ahead on the score scorecards going into the eighth round. Marcos Primera then lands an uppercut that hurts and scores a knockdown of Stevens. Stevens gets up, Primera moves in for the kill, he gets it, and he wins by the eighth round TKO. And Joe Antonacci, who is the ring announcer, had to announce that the 33-year-old Marcos Primera just won the youth super middleweight belt that he's not eligible for because he's 10 years too old for it. There you go. Yeah, they've been burned by this before. Yeah, Primera, I had done some of Primera's losses leading up to that fight. There you go. As I, I'll stay with you because I know I, you'll get us back on track here with all the lines leading up to tomorrow night. Okay, so the reason we have Amber here is because she is definitely an expert when it comes to betting. Fact, first show that we did, we previewed Lomachenko versus Tiafimo Lopez. And while we all picked uh, Lomachenko to win by decision, Amber revealed on the next show that she actually bet on Tiafimo Lopez and won three hundred dollars. So she is chick, very man. savvy. She's tricky. When it comes to this. She's, <laughs> yes, she is. She's very savvy. So she does, definitely deserves to be here doing this. So, as of today's taping, what are the general odds for this fight in terms of who is favored and what the over under is? So Canelo is the favorite at minus 425 at Station Casinos. DraftKings, which I'm going to talk about ahead, has a minus 400. Charlo is the underdog at plus 340. Uh, for those who don't understand this minus and plus, minus 425 means you would have to bet $425 on Canelo just to win 100. So makes sense why people would be uh, leaning toward the underdog. They're going to make more money. You bet $100 on Charlo, you'd win $340 if you were to win. The over under on how many rounds this will go is 10 and a half. And the favorite is the over at minus 280. So you'd have to bet $280 just to win 100 if you think this fight is going to go over 10 and a half rounds. If you think it's going to go under that there is a stoppage in there somewhere, plus 240, that's a good number. So a $100 bet would return $240. Do these numbers surprise you? You know, they don't. Um and what I do think that they show is that the odds makers are recognizing that Canelo is slowing down, that he's not quite the force that he once was. And it's probably in their best interest to not make him as big of a favorite as they have in the past. And so I brought up DraftKings. They have Canelo as a minus 400 in this fight against John Ryder. They had Canelo a minus 1600 favorite. And then against Triple G in their trilogy fight, a minus 500 favorite. So it shows they don't quite have as much confidence in Canelo as they once did. And then for the over-under on total rounds, that makes sense that the juice would be to the over because the past three fights of Canelo have all gone the distance, even when I think he's been trying to knock someone out like John Ryder. He wanted to get a knockout in front of his hometown fans came close to it but just couldn't get over that hump so uh this going the distance makes sense has there been a shift in sentiment since the fight was announced and if so who is the money rolling toward or rolling away from uh, I talked to an odds maker at Station Casino, and he said in the last two weeks, there's been no movement, no change in price on either guy. But 
then said, you know, you got to remember in boxing, we get a lot of the money on fight night. And so I think there will be movement fight night. And I think it would be, you know, a lot of the Mexican fans coming in from Mexico to Las Vegas. There are a lot of flights that they can take. Canelo always draws a huge crowd here in Las Vegas. And so once they get here, I would imagine they're going to lay money on the redhead, as Smitty likes to say, and that will drive up the price on him. So if you are going to bet Canelo, I think it would be better to do so sooner rather than later. Yeah. Now, uh, as we all know, there are far more betting options than just picking the winner and the over under. Uh, there are a whole bunch of prop bets that you can make. Uh, have, have were there any prop bets that really caught your eye that look attractive to you? Yeah, and the prop bets are where I would look because, gosh, if you think Canelo's going to win, that's a lot of money to lay just to win a little. So why not look for an angle somewhere? Um, if you are thinking that Canelo is ripe for an upset, because there are people out there who think that, then why not bet Charlo outright? And if Charlo were to win, I would think it would be by decision, given that Canelo has never been stopped and that Charlo's moving up two weight classes to fight Canelo. So if you want to get Charlo to win by decision, that's plus 450. So a hundred dollar bet returns $450. I did read that uh, International Boxing Hall of Fame trainer Freddie Roach is picking Charlo to win by stoppage. He thinks that mm -hmm. he's going to knock Canelo out. He thinks it'll be Charlo's left hook that's going to be Canelo's undoing. If you want to take a risk on that one, that's plus 1,000. So $100 bet would get you a thousand dollars for Charlo by knockout. Holy smokes. I mean, that's, that's pretty newsworthy that Freddie Roach thinks that it would be the left hook that would knock out Canelo because that's the hand that was broken mm -hmm. that canceled his fight with Tim Zoo. So pretty bold pick by Freddie. I, <laughs> I don't know how much up to date he's keeping on injuries, you know? Right. Right. Well, if, if you were a fan just uh, who would you, how would you bet? And if you were to recommend a wager, like among the prop bets, what would it be and why? Because there seems to be a difference. Like I told you, you know, you pick Lomachenko to win, but you bet on Tiafimo and you won. Or do you, do you find yourself uh, doing a split similar to that? Mm, not so much in this scenario. I do see the parallels. I mean, you have, you had the aging yet highly skilled pound for pounder and Lomachenko going up against a, a younger, more dynamic fighter in Teofimo Lopez. But I think because we've seen Canelo fight so much over the years, we just automatically assume that he's a lot older than Charlo, but that's not the case. These guys are the same exact age. Granted, Charlo has 26 less pro fights than Canelo. So Canelo has more wear and tear, but he also has a hell of a lot more experience against elite level competition dating back to when, you know, he was just 23 years old and fought Floyd Mayweather Jr. That was one of his two losses in his 18 years as a pro, uh, the other being to Dimitri Bivol when he went up to 175 pounds, but you go in between Floyd Mayweather and Bivol and he's beat guys like Arislan Lada, Miguel Cotto, Sergey Kovalev at 175, Gennady Glovkin. So his ring IQ is just immense. And then you add to that that Charlo is moving up to weight classes. And I think Canelo wins by decision, which is minus 150. So a $150 bet would get you 100. I would play it a little bit more safe, I think, than I did in the Teofimo fight. Right. So uh, so that's your pick? That's my pick, Canelo okay. by decision. Okay, and on that note, I flip to Lee Groves with your pick. I, I would imagine you're probably going the same way, I would think. Well, you know, uh, boxing history is replete with examples of champions of, of different weight classes going up against each other, even skipping multiple weight divisions. In fact, Canelo did it uh, against Kovalev. He went from 160 to 175, but... This isn't your usual good big man versus good little man match because the guy moving up in weight is actually four inches taller and he'll have a two and a half inch reach advantage. Um, and then the guy who is perceived to be past his prime is actually 60 days younger, right? Yeah. Uh, than, than, than Charlo. 
And, and finally, when this fight was originally announced, Charlo's chances were kind of poo-poo. But as we've heard, you know, there, there are good reasons to pick Charlo. And the most compelling one to me is that Canelo has shown signs of erosion. Uh, in fact, Canelo admitted as much in the uh, second part of the Showtime All Access series. Uh, he promises to offer a rebuttal in the ring, but he, he, he knows that he hasn't performed as well in recent fights. Um, I think that if history is to be a guide, this will be a tense, low volume affair for long stretches until one man lands a bomb and then the war will be on. Both men have terrific chins. I think this will probably go the distance. And as much as I am concerned about Canelo's decline, I'm also concerned about the 16 month layoff for Charlo. I'm concerned about the hand injury uh, and, and the fact that Canelo has a history of favorable judging in Las Vegas. It, it might not come to that, but it's there. It could be a factor. So I think while Charlo will have his moments, I'm still picking Canelo to win on points. All right. I guess it's my turn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know, when you, when you mention the, the overriding thing in this, in terms of uh, what I think would favor Canelo, of course, would be his experience and uh, yeah, the high blood pressure, the, uh, you know, the time off by the inactivity by Jermel Charlo, you know, I, I call it uh, boxing's high, high blood pressure. It's, it's that thing you can't see, but it, it catches up with you. However, however, uh, and you mentioned uh, Canelo. I don't think that Canelo is going to be too big. If something is too big for Jamel, it won't be Canelo. Not at all. Not in this fight. It'll be maybe the moment will be too big. That's the same thing I thought about Bivol. The only reason I thought Canelo might even beat Bivol, because everything I thought my eyes told me was, uh, and you and I watched that fight together, Amber. I thought Bivol would beat this version of Canelo. Um, so now to the fight plan for Canelo. I just think he just needs to kind of as uh, as Tommy told us, he just needs to be Canelo and do what he does uh, and try to do it at a little better, higher, faster pace than he's done in his last few fights. For Jermel, this is where he has to do something he's never done. He has to perform at a level higher than we've ever seen. And he has to do it with the D word, discipline. He has to be disciplined. Jab, what I wrote down was jab, 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 then jab, begin with the jab, end with the jab. Uh, lateral movement. He has great legs when he utilizes them. Lateral movement, but not to one side, as you do avoiding a guy's right or a guy's left. Canelo is a two-fisted fighter, so you move both ways. And absolutely do not lounge or languish on the ropes like he did in the first Castaño fight. In that second fight, he only went to the ropes a few times and he and he did it to spin off and land his own counters, which he did, of course, and he avenged that with a, a tremendous stoppage. You two and everybody uh, has done the conventional wisdom. It's to pick the redhead, even if Jermel does... Uh, best Canelo. We've seen this happen before with Triple G and, and and perhaps Lara. Canelo gets the damn nod anyway. However, however, I'm going to go sexy with this one. Maybe it's this crud virus that I I have, but I'm I'm and I've done a lot of uh study on this fight, maybe too much. But this fight to me has the aroma of a fight I uh, sat ringside at in 1994. Uh, then 87, 0 and 1, Julio Cesar Chavez was facing a hell of a, a boxer and my uh, late friend Frankie Randall. And I had done a lot of study and I spent a lot of time with Frankie leading up to that fight. And I just thought Chavez was slowing down, didn't have that ability to cut the ring off. This guy had a great jab, could box. He could move both ways. He was athletic. You know, he was a, a little taller and a little longer. And he bested Chavez by a split decision. Should have been a unanimous decision. Um, so I'm picking Jermel Charlo to defeat Canelo Alvarez. 
and win those 72 belts, including the Pueblo belt, uh, Charlo <laughs> wins the fight. I, I think, and and for those who, who say, well, Canelo will turn it on, you can't just all of a sudden turn it on. I mean, if he couldn't turn it on against Ryder with, you know, 8 million Mexicans in his hometown screaming for him, how is he going to do it on tomorrow night against uh, Jermel Charlo? Conventional wisdom, say Canelo, Smitty, say Jermel by decision. Either way, I think you're right, Lee. I don't see this as being some sizzling barn burner. I think I think in order for Jamel to win the fight, he's going to have to do some of those cerebral things. Canelo is a slow starter, uh, and now he's become a slow finisher, which I think could be his undoing tomorrow night. And there you have it. We want to thank uh, Tommy Yankello for being with us. Uh, remember to check out his world-class boxing channel. Regis Progre, our buddy, and it was, uh, of course, uh, officially announced at taping today that he'll be defending that belt ag Ooh. against Devin Haney uh, December Ooh. the 9th in Frisco. Uh, I might go over for that uh, for that fight. And Amber, what can we look out for for you? Is there a way, because this is a global broadcast, can people check out uh, your, your show uh, be, streaming or something like that? Your uh, yeah. Nevada Week? Nevada Week on Vegas PBS is on YouTube. It's also okay. VegasPBS.org slash Nevada Week. We have a unique show coming up with aging burlesque performers. Uh, okay, you know, that's you just, know, the, that's just the long... thing I need. To, that's just, the, <laughs> that's just the, the, the vision that I need getting ready to go. Lay hey, down it's, a, it's a real issue in Las Vegas. A lot of variety show performers move here for careers you know, but they can't perform always later in life and weren't always paying into the tax system, right? Getting paid under the table. Something so we need maybe a home for them. We need to set up a home for aging burlesque uh, chicks. <laughs> and it ain't going to be Tara Murphy Drive. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. All right. I love the show you just, oh, Auto made his uh, television debut, didn't he? That was great. Mm -hmm. Quickly tell us about that. Okay. Well, quickly. Uh, we had on the state Senate majority leader, Nicole Cannizzaro, who during this last legislative session had a baby at the hospital, five days later went back to the legislative session, had her baby on her chest the entire time and legislated. So I wanted to ask her how she did it and then try to do it myself. So we both had our babies there. It was a little messy and wild, but um Otto threw all my papers off the table. He unhooked my mic. It was interesting. That was the best thing I think he's ever done. Uh, and, and yeah, un unhooking that mic. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, you're doing a great uh, job with that. Lee Groves, uh, thank you. Enjoy the fight, everybody. So long. <laughs>